Good morning. If you were on our Facebook feed yesterday for our services, uh, you'll notice that at the end of the, the video cut out, uh, we had some internet issues. So we're re-recording the message and we'll just start from the beginning this morning. So you can catch the tail end of it. We had several people that were a little upset that they didn't catch the end. So we'll just start from the beginning and, and go from there this morning and, and post it again. Uh, the theme for the past several weeks has been the Christian family. And for the final message today, I would like for us to look at Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4, and also several verses in 1 Corinthians 7. So we'll start in Ephesians 6. Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Then 1 Corinthians 7, first two verses. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. And then down to verse 8. Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. The Gaither Vocal Band sings a song titled, Build an Ark. And the theme of the song is, just as Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood, we need to build the ark of our homes so that our families can be saved through Jesus Christ. One phrase repeated in the song is, Build an ark, held for the open waters, save your sons and your daughters. And I think it's time for us to build an ark. Once again, as it was in, the day, in Noah's time, the world is filled with wickedness, violence, and evil imaginations. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the, at the coming of the Son of Man. The earth is, going to be destroyed, is not going to be destroyed again by a flood. The rainbow promises that. But it is going to be destroyed one day. Peter writes in his second letter in chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. We cannot literally build an ark that's going to protect our families against that. But we can make our homes a spiritual fortress. We can make our homes a place where each family member receives salvation through Jesus Christ. We can, like Noah, walk with God and find favor in his eyes. And our families can live under the protection of his grace. And we've been discussing how we can build our homes according to God's specifications. And I'm confident that for the 120 years that Noah was building the ark, his three sons and their wives pitched in to help and did everything they could. And we need the help of married couples who are consistently weaving their wives' lives together, of parents who are training their children to be submissive to the authority of God. We need the help of grandparents who are encouraging their grandchildren to know the Lord. But today on this final message on the home, I would like to speak to the youth and the single people about your assignment and helping make the life of the family be as stable as it can be. First, I want to talk to the teenagers, those who are still living in the home. Obviously, Ephesians 6 makes it clear that the primary responsibility of young people is to be submissive to the authority of the parents. It says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it says, honor your father and mother so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Teenagers, if you rebel against your parents, there are at least three negative consequences. First, you violate the will of God for your life. God intends for you to be submissive to the authority of your parents as long as you're living under their roof or as long as they're supporting you. If you lie to them about what you're doing, or you stay out later than they want you to, or if you have an arrogant attitude in the home, you are outside the will of God. There aren't many qualifiers in this verse. It doesn't say obey your parents as long as they're consistent, or as long as they communicate well, or if they agree with the parents of other teenagers. 
there's only one qualifier, and that is obey your parents and the Lord. The only time you have the right to disobey your parents is when they ask you to do something directly contrary to Scripture. For example, maybe you want to become a Christian and they say no. Then you have the right to disobey. But even then, you should do your best to communicate it and ask for help from youth leaders. Second, when you disobey your parents, you not only violate God's will, but you put stress on your parents' lives and their marriage. A dad called home one day and the teenage son answered the phone. The dad asked to speak to the mother and the son said, Who is this? The dad said, This is the smartest man in the world and I want to speak to, with my wife. The boy said, You have the wrong number. And he hung up on the dad. Now that's funny in a way, but when you rebel and you have a sarcastic spirit toward your parents, you can make the home miserable by your rebellious spirit. You can work at dividing your parents, pitting them against each other. You might say, I've got it all under control. I'll know when to come back to the Lord. But your parents aren't so sure, and they lie awake at night, waiting for you to come home. Or they discuss with each other the right approach to take, and you cause them gray hairs and ill health and additional stress in the home and the marriage. That's unfair and it's thoughtless. And you'll come to regret that later in life when you have your own children. Third, when you disobey your parents, you're limiting your future potential. The passage from Ephesians tells you, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. When you learn to obey your parents, their instructions will cause life to go better for you. But more importantly, if you have a submissive, unselfish attitude toward your parents, you'll be better prepared for marriage later on. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul talks about the attributes of husbands and wives towards one another. And you know what the very first instruction to them is? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, to be successful in marriage, both husband and wife have to make concessions. Both have to be submissive. Both have to yield to the will of the other. And if you've never learned to be submissive to your parents as a teenager, if you've not learned to give in and make concessions, then it will be very difficult for you to have a successful marriage later. Honor your father and mother so that your marriage in the future will go well with you. You'll see that you can create a positive spirit in the home by cooperating right now. Let's say, for example, your parents leave and they say, when we get back, we want you to have your bedroom cleaned. It looks terrible. You start playing a video game and you forget. When your parents pull in the driveway, you suddenly remember. Gravel, tires in the gravel have a tendency to do that. So you sprint to your bedroom, you throw the covers over the bed, throw some stuff in the closet. And your parents walk in knowing that you've not cleaned your room and they get mad. They talk about how irresponsible you are. You'll be grounded for a month if you don't straighten up. Then you mumble about how unfair it is to be living in this concentration camp. You slam doors and the whole house is miserable. It's not going well. Then later in the week, you turn to the parents and you say, Mom and Dad, there's a football game this weekend and I'd really like to go with my friends. Can I borrow the car? We'll probably go eat somewhere after the game, so could I have $10? Dad hits the ceiling. You've been so irresponsible and disrespectful. Now you come around acting all nice and sweet and trying to get on our good side. No, you can't have the car. We're staying at home and having a family night Friday night. And everybody's just happy and excited to be spending time as a family on Friday night. But what if you had a submissive, humble spirit? Your whole attitude is different. It would go much better for you. When mom and dad say clean up your room, you say sure. You go upstairs when they leave and you clean your room. Mom and dad come home and they think they've got the best kid in the world. You've mowed the grass and you've washed the dishes too. Then later in the week when you ask about the football game in the car, dad smiles and he says, sure, you've been so cooperative this week. Here's the car keys. How about $20 just to make sure you have enough? Stay out as late as you need to. We trust you. Now, maybe that's a pretty exaggerated illustration. But what a difference it would make in the home if as a teenager you were a little more cooperative, a little more submissive, a little sweeter in spirit. Honor your father and mother that it'll go well with you. That's sound advice. Christian families also need help with 
single people in the home. According to a U.S. News & World Report article in February of this year, 52% of American households are single adults. The majority of the adults in our country are single. The article gave no distinction whether the singles were married or if they were ever married or if they were, were divorced or widowed. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians 7 for a moment and let's look at five principles for single people that will be helpful in the home. One lady suggests that a girl between birth and 18 needs a good mother. Between 18 and 35, she needs good looks. Between 35 and 55, she needs a good personality. And after age 55, she needs cash. Now, we all may need cash before then, but these are the principles that we need spiritually. First, be positive about your singleness. In verse 1, Paul says it's good for a man not to marry. He said later in verse 26 that he was writing because of the present crisis. There's persecution going on, and we need to take that in consideration to keep Paul's words in proper context. Sometimes our Western culture gives the impression that if you don't marry, you're a failure. At family reunions, Grandma comes up and she says, Still by yourself, huh? There must be a dozen young women just standing in line to meet a handsome young man like you. Others in our culture over-glamorize the single life. There's a cartoon that shows two worn-down looking mothers standing on the street corner with children just crawling all over them. A young woman is waving and driving past in a red, red convertible sports car. And one mother is looking at the girl in the car and telling her friend, Poor Nancy, she just never could find a man. We over-glamorize the single life sometimes, but Paul says that singleness can be a blessing to the Christian. It may be God's will for you. In verse 8 he says, Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, It is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. It was a benefit to Paul not to be married. He was gone so much as a missionary. He was persecuted, and he could do more for the Lord since he was single. So if you're single, don't feel bad. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't be jealous of those who have families. It just may be God's will for your life. You may have a number of opportunities for service at this time that you wouldn't have had if you were married. One author said, said it is impossible for you to be happily married until you are happily single. Until you have a positive attitude where you are right now, God cannot use you in the way he wants to. Your chances for influencing others are minimized by a negative attitude. In verse 2, Paul says, But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. In verse 9, But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So the second principle is, be distinctive in your moral values. Now you know that goes absolutely contrary to what our culture promotes today. Many of our television programs show characters playing musical beds without any consequences and without any guilt. But Paul makes it clear that even though there is so much immorality today, as a Christian, you are to be distinctive. Paul doesn't give any qualifiers here. He doesn't say this is valid up until the 21st century. This doesn't apply after you're 25 years old. It doesn't apply if you've been married before. Paul, who was single, writes in another passage, flee from sexual immorality. If you disregard these instructions, you're undermining the sanctity of the family. You're setting a bad example for other people who look up to and respect you. Now, this requires discipline, but remember that all things are possible through Christ. If you're not walking with God in your moral life, it makes it extremely difficult for him to bring into your life the person that he's picked out for you. Think about Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery when he was 17 years of age. Ten years later, he was living in the heights of Egypt as a slave to Potiphar. Now, Joseph was young and handsome, and Potiphar's wife approached him one day and said, Come lie with me. Now, Joseph could easily have rationalized and participated. He could have said, My mother died when I was a little boy. My father was overindulgent with me. My brothers hated me. Here I am, single and in a foreign country. The moral values here are atrocious. 
Surely God cannot expect me to remain pure in these conditions. This temptation is more than I can stand. But what Joseph did say was, How could I do this wicked thing and sin against my God? Then he turned and ran. Let me say to those who are single, and really to each of us here this morning, next time you get into a compromising situation, let that phrase come back to you. How could I do this thing and sin against my God? You be distinctive. Even if you're the only one, you be different. Third, be perceptive about anti-family propaganda. Being single, you're particularly vulnerable to anti-family philosophies that undermine the foundation of the Christian home. There have been some inequities toward women in the workforce, especially in terms of equal pay for equal work. But there are inequities in every field. Teacher salaries aren't what they should be. Short people face inequities in athletics. They're always the last ones picked. And in trying to correct inequities, people go to extremes and they create larger problems. The feminists have become so angry that they become anti-family and anti-marriage. Listen to this quote from a feminist brochure from a few years ago. Marriage has existed for the benefit of men and has been a liberally sanctioned method of control over women. Therefore, it's important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and not to live individually with men and seek to destroy marriage. A former president of the National Organization for Women said that she wants to eliminate sex, marriage, motherhood, and love, claiming that marriage is legalized servitude. Now, I know that those are radical statements that don't represent everyone involved in the feminist movement, but they represent the leadership and the intent of that movement is to destroy the family. So be perceptive. Don't get taken in by that worldly approach, even if you're the victim of inequality on occasion. The feminist philosophy of inequality of the sexes is so far off base that it needs to be rebutted again and again. When God created us male and female, he made us distinctively different. We're not the same physically. We're not the same emotionally. We're not the same psychologically. Doctors have discovered that even the chromosomes of our bodies are different. Every cell is unique. The male ego, for example, is usually a lot bigger in males than females. When a woman is lost driving the car, she doesn't hesitate to stop and ask for directions. But us men will drive around for 45 minutes rather than ask a complete stranger that we'll never see again for directions because we're too proud to admit that we're lost. God has created us differently. And if those differences are ignored or discouraged, then marriage is undermined. What I'm saying is, as a Christian, be perceptive enough to reject those philosophies that undermine the family. Fourth, be supportive of church family programs. We do a lot of things in this church's families, and we need to. But if single people are not careful, they can resent that. You can't feel left out and become critical. The church needs to be sensitive to your needs, but you should be sensitive to the present era too, and the family needs strengthening. Be an encourager of families. If services don't apply to you, attend anyway. Too much time alone can make you introverted. The Bible says to practice hospitality. Maybe you can invite other singles or other families to dinner or church programs. And fifth, be submissive to the will of God for your future. Don't marry someone outside the will of God. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. That simply means don't marry someone who doesn't share your Christian values. No matter how attractive, no matter how rich, no matter the chemistry between you, don't do it. The temptation is, as you grow older, to compromise on those convictions. You try to rationalize. My situation's different. I think you'll come to church with me after we get married. I think I can convert her after, the, after we're married. And you give in, asking for God's blessing. But Paul says very plainly, do not be equally, unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Make a commitment to the Lord that you're going to be faithful to his word. 
even if it means remaining single. It's better to walk in the light with God than to be in the dark with thousands that are without him. When you learn to fly an airplane, part of that process includes being blindfolded by the instructor. He then banks the plane left and right. He goes up and down, goes in circles, trying to disorient the student. Then the pilot gives the controls to the student who can only see the instrument panel. The decision must then be made to trust your own instincts or trust the instrument panel to correct the flight of the plane. In the Christian walk, there will be times when your feelings will lead you astray. There's a way that appears, right, that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. You may be infatuated with someone, and all the chemistry may be right, but the instrument panel of the Word of God contradicts that. You have a choice between your feelings and between God's Word. And I beg you to live your life according to the instrument panel of truth, because if you don't, you're headed for a crash. We've often heard God has not called you to be happy. He's called you to be holy and obedient. If you're obedient, he will see to it in the end that all things work together for good. But any time your idea of personal happiness takes precedence over what God has clearly specified in his word, it's disastrous. Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Today, one in four children are raised by single parents. Forty years ago, it was one in ten. The percentage of unmarried parents who are dads as primary caregiver has more than doubled in that same time. Dr. James Dobson calls single parenting the toughest job in the world, and I tend to agree with him. But single parents, I would ask that you would make this one commitment, that you would raise your children up to know God. Don't stay away from the church because most of the activities have mom and dad both present. We need you here. We want you here. And now more than ever, you need to be here. It's almost impossible to fill the role of both mom and dad. So trust the Lord to fill in the gaps. Make sure your kids are involved in all the church activities they can so that we can give as much positive reinforcement as possible. Just as Noah and his family took 120 years to build the ark because they knew they were living in the season of the flood, I believe the season of Jesus' return is close. As it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be when the Son of Man returns. So let's do our part to make the family an ark of safety where each member comes to know Jesus Christ. That's the most important assignment we have. The psalmist wrote, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promises and the instruction from your word on the family. Whether we be parents or children or grandparents or singles or wherever we may fall in that, we all have family. And Lord, I just pray for your continued guidance for each one of us as we continue to build an ark of safety for our families. That we will have that place to go when your son does return. Lord, help us to all be ready when that day comes so that we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen.